Gripped with uncertainty, prolonged hope and desperation, friends and families around the world have faced wondering if their loved ones are safe, hurt, or even alive. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we will be taking a look at people who strangely disappeared and whether they were found. The Disappearance of Aaron Hedges Originally from Bozeman, Aaron Hedges was a hunter and along with his friends Joe Depew and Greg Leitner, they ventured to the Crazy Mountains in Montana in September of 2014. Equipped with two horses and a mule, the group of three's initial plan was to spend a week around the Cottonwood Lake Trail and create a base camp at Campfire Lake. Well prepared, Aaron was armed with a bow and arrows and a handgun. His fellow hunters Joe Depew and Greg Leitner carried rifles. On September 3rd, 2014, the hunters set off. Despite being well prepared, the mule that was carrying their supplies was spooked and ended up throwing their supplies off the trail. It's important to note this included Aaron's sleeping bag. It wasn't until the 5th of September that Aaron decided he should try and replace his lost sleeping bag and set off with a plan to shelter within the group's hunting camp from their trip the year before and recover a cache containing a sleeping bag. However, Depew and Leitner insisted he return to camp before nightfall. As at night, that area can become dangerous and Aaron agreed to return to camp that night. Aaron would not return that evening. At around 4pm that day, Joe and Greg tried contacting Aaron via their walkie-talkies. These were Garmin walkie-talkies and it actually displayed each of their GPS positions. To the rest of the group's surprise, Aaron's GPS position showed that he was going the complete wrong direction and he was heading northeast. Unfortunately, this would be the last time they saw Aaron's GPS position. After Aaron had still not returned on the 6th of September, Joe and Greg had come to the assumption Aaron was indeed missing. This was further unsettling when on the 7th of September, a snowstorm swept through the area, plummeting temperatures and unleashing at least 18 inches of snow across the area. Despite this realization, it wasn't until the 8th of September that Aaron was reported missing by his wife. Aaron's friends insisted they didn't report him missing because he was experienced in the area and also armed. The Park County Search and Rescue was tasked with finding Aaron and Corporal Greg Todd, who was in charge, spoke of how this lack of urgency was strange and that he wouldn't have waited as long as Joe and Greg did to report Aaron missing. The official search for Aaron was drastically hindered due to the aforementioned snowstorm, making it practically impossible to search on foot. However, eventually dog and horse teams as well as 59 ground crew, along with the National Guard and helicopters, joined the search for the missing Aaron. It wasn't until the 9th of September the search and rescue teams finally had a breakthrough. Aaron's boots were found along with a water container and a nearby fire pit was found too. This was it though. There was nothing else in that area. What's truly bizarre is search and rescue had swept the same spot the day before and had found nothing. Furthermore, given the severe cold weather, it seems very strange that Aaron would take his boots off and leave them. He wouldn't have made it very far without them either. This was the only hard evidence until the 22nd of September when officials involved decided that the search and rescue presence be reduced awaiting additional information. There was no breakthrough in this case until, in 2015, Roger Bezlanovich stumbled across Aaron Hedges' backpack and clothing whilst visiting family. The bag contained Aaron's gun and driving license, along with his bow and clothing. It appeared that smaller animals had been trying to get into the bag as small holes were present all over it. It was then, on August 8, 2016, that at a nearby ranch, trailgoers found a human skull. With this new information, law enforcement in the area began a full-scale search on the area the skull was found and managed to find most of Aaron's skeleton within just a 70-yard area. Aaron's cell phone was found on his body, but despite best efforts, it was too corroded after spending two years outside on the trail. This case is mysterious for many reasons. Given the route it's believed he took, it's not understood why he went this way. After all, Aaron was an experienced outdoorsman and this was a route he should have avoided. Him leaving his boots despite being in heavy snow, or the fact that where Aaron was found was within view of nearby buildings and not too far from a road, why didn't he seek help? 
though it's believed Aaron didn't go for shelter due to not wanting to get caught for trespassing. The Martin Family Disappearance On December 7, 1958, Ken and Barbara Martin drove from their home in Portland, Oregon to Columbia Gorge in Hood River, Oregon. They went to look for a Christmas tree with their three daughters, 14-year-old Barbara, 12-year-old Virginia and 10-year-old Sue. No one ever saw them alive again. According to reports, the family left their home at around 1pm. Friends began calling the police when they didn't return after a while, but no one took the case right away. After a few days, police found a credit card receipt showing that Ken bought gas near the gorge. Based on tire tracks, the Hood River Sheriff believed that while trying to back up in the parking lot, they must have accidentally driven off the cliff into the Columbia River. Detective Walter Graven thought the family's trip seemed odd, and he continued to investigate despite what the sheriff had concluded. While inspecting the tire tracks, he also found paint chips nearby. He sent the paint chips to be examined at an FBI crime lab, and they confirmed that the chips matched the Martin family's car. Someone found a gun close by near a car that had been stolen and abandoned. Although they turned it over to the police, the gun was never used as evidence in the case. The gun was covered in blood, leading Graven to believe it was used to beat someone to death. Graven eventually connected the gun to the parent's son, 28-year-old Donald Martin, who was in the Navy at the time. Years before this, Donald had been accused of stealing a gun while working in a sporting goods store. It was believed that this was the gun he had supposedly stolen. Graven found out that Donald didn't have a great relationship with his family and that he never came back to Oregon to look for his family. Graven believed that Donald must have had something to do with the family's disappearance because no one else seemed to have any motive. In May 1959, the bodies of Virginia and Sue were found floating in the river. According to the autopsy, the death of both girls was caused by drowning. Virginia also had a hole in her head, which only led to more questions. Unfortunately, it was never confirmed what caused the hole. Donald didn't attend the memorial service, but he did meet with Detective Graven in June. He told Graven he didn't know of anyone who would want to hurt his family, but that he didn't believe it could have been an accident either. The story stayed in the news for almost a year after the family's disappearance. Many investigators and journalists have tried to find out what happened that day, but no one has been successful. Graven had always said the case probably wouldn't be solved unless they could find the car and the other bodies. Before he died in 1988, he gave his notes to Jay Waterbury, who worked with the Dallas Police Department. Waterbury has hope that the case will be solved one day. Disappearance of Ravel Balmain Last seen in 1994, Ravel was a 22-year-old professional dancer and model. She led a double life, however, that she kept hidden from her closest friends and family. Ravel was also a casual escort, but according to some reports, Ravel had started doing this in order to save money for a trip to Japan that would further her professional dancing career. The last person believed to see Ravel alive was Gavin Samer. He claims that he had won $150 at a casino that night, which he decided to spend on a woman. When he called the agency that Ravel worked for, he gave a fake name. Thankfully, the agent did its due diligence at that point and noticed that the name Gavin gave was not the name his phone was registered to. When they called him back and told him what they found, he conceded and gave his real name. Gavin Samer claimed to have had a girlfriend at the time, which may have been his reason for giving a fake name. Samer claims after their appointment, he drove Ravel to the Red Tomato Inn and left her there. There are no witnesses to corroborate this. Around this location, Ravel's last known location, her makeup bag, keys and one shoe was found. Ravel's body has not been recovered. Samer remains the number one person of interest in the case, a fact that he is straightforward with when he is interviewed. Samer spent about 15 years living in Tasmania as a recluse, until 2018 when he pleaded guilty to old theft charges. Strangely, years later, another person close to Samer suffered a sudden death. In April of 2020, he was arrested for assaulting his former roommate. He was accused of committing violation offences against her will, but the charges were dropped when she passed away tragically in an explosion in her apartment. 
Though this does not prove motive, it does seem too strange to be a coincidence. In May of 2021, the family announced a $1 million reward for anyone with information that would lead to the discovery of Ravel's remains. Mary Curie's remains were not found for 60 years. Ravel's family hoped to have some closure before then. They have already waited 26 years in the dark, and sadly both of her parents passed away without ever finding out what happened to their daughter. Kyron Horman Our last case is the sad case of Kyron Horman, a young boy who disappeared in 2010 aged just seven years old. After his mother started suffering from challenging health issues, Kyron went to live with his father, Kane, and his new partner, Terry. On the 4th of June, 2010, Kyron's stepmother, Terry, took him to Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon, where he was a student in the second grade. They attended a science fair at the school before she said goodbye. Terry says she saw Kyron walking down the corridor to attend his first class at around 8.45 a.m. and then drove away from the school to run some errands. Terry returned home where she uploaded photos to Facebook of Kyron attending the science fair. However, Kyron never made it to class and his teacher marked him as absent that day. Within an hour of saying goodbye to his stepmother, the young boy had seemingly vanished without a trace. After school, Terry and Kyron's father walked to the bus stop to wait for him. They expected that, like on any other day, Kyron would have taken the school bus home. However, after talking to the driver, they were horrified to discover that Kyron had never boarded the bus home. Immediately, they called the school, and the secretary reported that Kyron had not even made it to his first class that morning. What could possibly have happened to this little boy? Frustratingly for all involved, very little concrete progress has been made with the investigation into Kyron's disappearance, despite significant media interest and thorough searches of the area conducted by trained searchers and hundreds of volunteers. Despite reports from Kyron's mother that the search had been narrowed down to less than 100 acres, 10 years on, we still do not know what happened to Kyron. Kyron's mother Desiree has often stated her belief that Terry may be in some way responsible for Kyron's disappearance, and even tried to file a civil lawsuit against her in 2012. It must be noted that Terry Horman has never been identified as a suspect in this case. Indeed, not one suspect or even a description of a suspect has ever been identified in the 10 years since Kyron's disappearance. Whatever the circumstances behind this bizarre and tragic case, let's hope that one day Kyron's family gain closure and somehow find the strength to move on with their lives after enduring what is surely every parent's worst nightmare. It's sad to think that families and loved ones are left in the unknown. We can only hope that future advancements in technology may solve some of these mysteries and provide much-needed closure for the families of the victims. But what do you make of these disappearances and the stories behind them? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.